Welcome to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. My name's Simon Smart. And I'm Natasha Moore. Well, the global demand for energy is higher than it's ever been and will continue to grow for decades to come as the world's population increases and more and more parts of the world gain access to electricity. Today, the majority of the world relies on non-renewable sources such as oil, coal and gas. But as their name suggests, these resources will eventually run out. Renewable sources, solar, wind and water, have certainly made their mark. But what about nuclear fusion energy? One of the key applications of plasma physics is to try to bring the energy source of the sun and stars, which is nuclear fusion power, down to Earth and make it available for humans. That was Ian Hutchinson. He's a professor at MIT who works at the cutting edge of nuclear fusion. Not to be confused, of course, with nuclear fission, which is how nuclear power is currently generated. Fusion is the taking of light elements like hydrogen isotopes, fusing them together, the nuclei of those elements, and that yields energy. That is, if you like, the opposite of what we do with the existing nuclear power, which is fission power that's taking heavy elements like uranium and breaking it up. The advantage is... Fusion power has the potential to become a virtually endless source of energy for generations to come and a cleaner source of energy. Secondly, it doesn't produce fission wastes, highly radioactive particles in nearly the same way that fission does. And there are a number of... Other but there's just a slight hurdle this technology needs to clear. Approximately 100 million degrees Celsius is what we need. That's hotter than the centre of the sun. This 100 million degrees Celsius issue is just one of the problems that Ian and his team at MIT and other physicists all around the world are trying to solve. I had the pleasure of catching up with Ian during his recent trip to Sydney. Later in the program, we'll ask Ian about his passion for science and thirst for knowledge and how his Christian faith plays a role in all of that. But first, we discuss whether nuclear fusion is the way forward to meet the world's ever-growing demand for energy. There is no magic bullet for energy resources for humankind. So I, I don't want to promote fusion as being some kind of instant solution to all of the energy problems that exist. But I believe uh, that for the long term, we're going to need nuclear power if we're going to reduce the impact on the climate that has been produced and is continuing to be produced by burning fossil fuels. And fusion offers us an attractive option that can power human society far into the future. You have been involved in some very significant experiments in this field. For, for the layperson, could you just explain this key area of your work, what it's trying to do? Yes, so we need to have incredibly hot plasma gaseous medium in order to make the fusion reactions take place. 100 million degrees Celsius. Well, if you have something that's that hot, you don't simply put it in a, in, in a bottle and hope that it's going to sit there because it would just vaporize the bottle. So instead, what has to happen is a plasma like that has to be held in place by an immaterial force. Now, the immaterial force that holds together nature's fusion reactors, the sun and stars, is gravity. But gravity works only on the very large scale. So we're trying to bring fusion power down to the human scale. So we need to use a stronger, still immaterial force, and we use a magnetic field. So we um, create a magnetic configuration, a configuration of extremely strong magnetic fields in which we trap the plasma to keep it away from any solid or material surfaces and we heat it up to these incredibly high temperatures and we seek to release the energy from those fusion reactions. And the big challenge is first of all getting it hot which we've learned how to do and and we know how to get uh, the plasma hot but secondly and more importantly we have to keep it hot long enough, we have to prevent the heat from leaking out of it sufficiently well Uh, that the reactions can take place. And that is the ongoing challenge, which we think we've got a handle on, but we haven't yet demonstrated it to the point where we can actually practically make energy. And I don't think we're going to, you know, have fusion electricity on the grid, you know, in the next 20 years, but 
we are in a position, and we're currently constructing a large experiment, magnetically confined plasma experiment, in the south of France, which, if it's successful, will, will release about 500 megawatts, that's about half of a big power station, of fusion power for a few hundreds of seconds at a time. It won't be generating electricity, this will be a scientific experiment, but it will be a scientific demonstration of controlled fusion reactions. Ian himself has played a rather big role in all of this as the science inches closer to making nuclear fusion energy a reality. One of the uh, wonderful opportunities that I have had in my scientific career at MIT is to uh, design, help design, and, and lead a team designing and constructing and eventually operating one of these major toroidal magnetic confinement devices called the tokamak. And uh, I and my team at MIT uh, still operate uh, this device 25 years later. It's the highest magnetic field, one has the strongest magnetic fields of any experiment. And I have to admit that uh, starting up that experiment uh, a couple of decades ago now was really a very much a highlight of my scientific career. What does the scientific process offer in terms of our knowledge of the world and how we understand it? Science functions predominantly by what I would call two main characteristics. Repeatable observations and experiments on the one hand, so reproducibility is key. And the second thing is what I call clarity, which basically means that when we do repeatable or not repeatable um, experiments or observations, we have to be able to tell whether they're repeatable or not. And that means we have to have a clear enough, unambiguous enough description of the results of an experiment or observation. So clarity and uh, reproducibility. What those give us is precisely the kind of knowledge that enables us to develop technology. So technology requires a reproducible, repeatable response from our world. And so natural sciences um, is is hand-in-hand with technology in a certain sense. Indeed, um, in the earliest development of science, Francis Bacon advocated the practical sciences in part because he foresaw that this would give us technologies which would, in his words, be for the relief of man's estate. In other words, he saw it as being an important duty to alleviate suffering and, uh, and so forth um, through the results of practical knowledge. So science is, if you like, supremely practical knowledge. It's the knowledge that gives us technology. But I think in our world today, even though we have amazingly powerful technology, I think it's a grave mistake to think that in some sense technology will save the world. I don't think that's going to be the case. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. If you've just joined us, we're partway through Simon's recent chat with MIT professor Ian Hutchinson, a leading nuclear physicist, and we're speaking to him about how his life and work are a fusion of science and faith. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. For a person steeped in the world of science and technology and as a person of Christian faith, I wondered what it was for Ian that suggested there's more to reality than physics and the natural world. Science works by being able to do repeatable observations or experiments. And it's vitally important in science um, that we're able to make those kind of repeatable observations, make careful measurements and and have clear descriptions of what the results of those and find them to be consistent. And so we're finding out in science about the ways in which the world behaves reproducibly. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing to find out about the world. There are lots of ways, I believe, in which the world behaves in unrepeatable ways. Uh, There are lots of experiences that people have that are not describable in the ways that natural science requires for its operation. And so one of my main interests is to talk about the fact that however powerful science may be, it is not true to think that science is all the real knowledge there is. There are other facets of human knowledge 
which I think are in many ways equally important. And I'm thinking about topics like history or uh, the arts or philosophy or literature or even language, very important endeavors for the human society that don't use the methods of the natural sciences. History, for example, has ways of discovering true facts about the world. You know, it is in fact the case that Julius Caesar was assassinated on the steps of the Senate in 44 BC in the Ides of March. But it isn't science that tells us that fact. It's all kinds of historical analysis which take into account um, the knowledge of the general history of the times, the way people thought, uh, the documents that we have that describe it, the testimonies, and so forth. These are uh, subjects which are not scientific. They're human. Uh, They take into account purpose and intention. And all of those kinds of things, which are rightly ruled out, in a certain sense, from scientific description, if you set aside all of those aspects of the world, you have a very impoverished view. It was really interesting, actually, to hear how Ian adopts a similar approach to his faith and belief in God. It seems to me, if you ask the question, is there a God, that is very much a metaphysical question. That Of all the questions that you could think of that were not scientific, that seems to me the one most likely to be thought of as not a scientific question. And yet, very often people will say, oh, that's a scientific question. Well, I think whether or not there is a God is a factual question, but I don't think that all facts are matters of science. I think that we can uh, investigate the question uh, of whether or not there is a God on lots of different levels. Science might have something to say about it, but there are many other uh, approaches to trying to understand whether God exists, which include evidences pertaining to various religious claims. It includes philosophy and, and, and classical arguments. It includes personal religious experience, uh, and it may involve communities and utility and so forth. So there are many um, ways in which one can approach that question. Almost none of them are scientific. Have there been moments in your scientific career where you've found uh, significant challenges to your faith? I generally adopt the view, which I think has been traditional throughout uh, Christian and scientific history, that science and religion should be partners, should help to interpret one another. And so I don't think that they are non-overlapping magisteria. Um, to use the phrase of Stephen Jay Gould. I don't think that religion and science are so separate that they have nothing to say to one another. I think science does sometimes correct and constrain our interpretations of the Bible. And I think that religion rightly sometimes constrains and corrects scientific practices. That should be the case. I think it's absolutely vital that, uh, for example, research on human subjects should be regulated by ethics and morals which are separate from science. And so I think that that overlapping of those two things are important. Um, Have I personally felt substantial challenges to my faith? I think I became a Christian as an undergraduate at Cambridge University, and there's a sense in which my science and my Christian faith grew up together. And so there certainly have been tensions and and puzzles and and wrestlings and and working out of what I think about uh, the balance between those two. But I've never seen them as being at sort of intrinsically at war in the way that they're often portrayed as being. I don't think that warfare model makes very much sense to me. You've been listening to Life and Faith with Simon Smart and Natasha Moore. We hope you enjoyed Simon's chat with MIT professor Ian Hutchinson on science, faith and knowledge. For more conversations like this, you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Just type Centre for Public Christianity in the search box to find us. While you're there, it would also help us a great deal if you leave us a rating or review. Next week, we kick off our four-part series featuring interviews from our forthcoming documentary, For the Love of God, How the Church is Better and Worse Than You Ever Imagined. We'll be covering topics like the Crusades, slavery, and human rights. You won't want to miss these excellent conversations coming up on Life and Faith.
We'll catch you then. 